everybody and welcome to today's event. My name is Emma Griffin, I'm here in my capacity as the President of the Royal Historical Society and it gives me real pleasure to invite you all to this afternoon's RHS training workshop for early career historians. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. I'd like to remind everybody that this event has subtitles. Um, there's a button on the bottom of your screen, a CC live transcript, and you can switch that on or off. That will give you um, subtitles or not as you prefer. I'll also just let you know that our event is being recorded and it's going to be made publicly available through the RHS website uh, within a few weeks. So if you cannot stay till the end, don't worry, you'll be able to catch up later. Okay, well, let me start by um, introducing our panelists today. Um, I'm delighted to welcome, first of all, Professor Elaine Chalice um, from the University of Liverpool. Elaine's a historian of English social and political history in the long 18th century, with a particular interest in the interplay of gender and politics. She joined the University of Liverpool in 2016 as its new head of department, following a career um, at Bath Spa University. And as head of department at Liverpool, um, she has extensive experience of mentoring PhD researchers as they prepare for academic careers, as well, of course, very intimate knowledge about the actual process of applying um, and appointing to jobs um, in the UK in the present time. I'm also delighted to welcome Professor Matthew Johnson from Durham University, where he is the Director of Undergraduate Studies in the History Department. And Matthew is a historian of modern Britain with a specialism in the impact of war and politics, uh, war on politics and society in Britain in the 20th century. He's also currently the History Department's Director of Undergraduate Studies and likewise has very extensive experience of candidate shortlisting and interviewing. And finally, um, Professor Julian Wright, a historian of modern Europe, currently at Northumbria University, where he's the acting de deputy faculty pro, pro VC for the Faculty of Arts, Design and Social Sciences. Julian is also a former head of department and has similarly extensive experience of career preparation and planning in history, as well as of academic applications. I should also mention here that Julian joined the RHS Council um, in 2021 um, as our new Secretary for Professional Engagement and in that capacity he's going to oversee our work to help promote career development and networking historians at every stage of their career. Okay well with our introductions done I'm going to uh, move on to open our event and get started. Elaine is going to speak to uh, speak for us first um, and I'll just a, 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 moment of a moment of explanation we've divided the event into two sessions in the first session that we're starting with, we're going to be thinking about kind of the longer term planning um, in terms of getting an academic job. So there's quite a lot of stuff you might need to do uh, a year, two years, three years before applying for a job. So that's where we're going to start in the first half of the um, session. And in the second half of the session, we're going to be thinking more minutely of the moment where you actually prepare a job application and walk in to do your first uh, job interview or job presentation. So we've got the kind of the longer term in the first half and the short immediate term in the second half. Well, with that um, out of the way, I will um, hand over to Elaine, who's going to tell us a little bit about the academic job market um, and the current, um, the current realities of looking for a job and applying for a job um, in, the UK, uh, in the UK today. Uh, Elaine, over to you. Thanks very much, Emma. I really appreciate it. And thank you for um, asking me to come in and to speak. Um, I'm hoping I can provide some useful information. I, I slightly structuring things perhaps a little bit differently than, than this, but I wanted to just say a little bit, first of all, about background. And I think this is something that um, I'm sure all of you who are out there listening are already aware of, but the academic job market is tight. And there's a lot of jobs right now that are, are going to be offered on short term, um, as, and there are less jobs at the moment on, uh, uh, offered as full-time jobs. So what, what you need to be thinking about is both short-term positions and full-time positions. And hopefully you know, the, the full-time position market will be opening up. Um, the number of posts in the different areas of history also varies significantly. And what I wanted to say immediately is that um, all of you should be, if you are thinking about a job in the next heaven knows how long, um, you know, take a good look at places where jobs are offered. Start uh, signing yourself up to job alert systems for your email, jobs act up, check things like um, HNET jobs regularly, and use your networks. Try to find out what's coming up because there, there will be positions coming through but you need to be aware of who's doing what, 
what kinds of, of um, positions are opening up, and if there are big developments that are coming through. So maybe reading through the Times Higher Ed, or the THE, or looking at other um, academic publications that are coming out saying, you know, somebody's planning to open up a brand new research center or something like that. There's a new uh, uh, program being opened. Then keep an eye on that because those are the kinds of places where you may find some, some really interesting job possibilities. Another point is to be aware of the award cycles. Um, we've always are looking at cycles that are going to be uh, with people getting research awards and consequently needing buyout time for uh, replacement teaching. Uh, but there will also be always uh, the, the cycles of the annual year when people may be leaving a post and taking up another post. So positions coming open at the end of, um, um, end of the spring session uh, for new positions opening up in, in October or September, depending on when the university starts, as well as the late spring and late autumn bulk of, of um, often replacement teaching positions, which open up after the award cycles are, are there. So one of the things that I wanted to, to, to say is these are things that you can do sort of in the long term, even if you aren't immediately planning to look for a job. But I also wanted to, to use this time particularly to think about things that heads bear in mind when they're recruiting. And Liverpool is a Russell Group University, but I've also worked at um, Post 92, and I've checked with various other uh, heads of department from other universities across the country to make sure that we're on the, I'm on the right track with telling you the kinds of things that I'm used to looking at when recruiting, just to give you a sense. And so things that heads tend to bear in mind when recruiting, um, and I'm going to divide this into three things. One is around research, one is around teaching, and the third one is around community, or what I'm calling community. And the first thing that any head is going to be looking for is what they need. And you can underline that in many different ways. Basically, they're going to be looking at something that fills a gap in their in their department that applies to a particular strategy that the university is developing or that the department wants to develop, taking it in a direction they want to go. Um, so you, you're looking for, and this is largely around permanent appointments, of course, but looking for what's needed, even for a fixed term appointment, look at what they're actually asking for. It's really, really important, and I can't stress this often enough, that you read through job specs very, very carefully. You construct your application by the essential and, des and desirable criteria. Some people still don't do that, and I've never understood that. There are always more overqualified people around than there are posts. So it really does matter that you pay real attention to what's being asked. Um, two other pieces of, of advice, which are really around the, the interview, and we'll probably say more about this later, but they're also worth thinking about now. And that is, as you're thinking about uh, applying for positions, start thinking about what kinds of things you might be able to use as examples for questions you know think questions that might be asked about your research experience or how you approach teaching or even thinking about uh, pedagogy or anything like that so try thinking about that and as you're you're building up your own experience you know make yourself a note of some some examples that you you can use to be able to answer so the concrete examples are always really important and the other thing to do is, is you start looking at jobs, is to make sure that you know what the institutions are. So not only keep an eye on what are the big developments that are going on in AG, you know, what's happening with RAF? Is there something new coming up with TEF? Um, how does the Office for Students, for instance, apply to what you might be doing? But also look at the different institutions. So when it comes down to starting to put to, together your application, do your homework, make sure that you know what's going on and in, in that particular institution. So use the website and do take a good look at that. Quickly on looking at research, it's important to know where, where we are in the REF cycle, because this is going to affect the kinds of demands that heads are gonna be looking for from the people who are applying for jobs. So if we're early in the REF cycle, probably going to be looking um, for about one piece published in a good journal for somebody who's just coming out not having done postdocs um, and a co some kind of a convincing coherent plan for the next project maybe where you might look for funding but something it doesn't have to be long but be brief and coherent if we're talking mid to late cycle re ref much more important looking at um, 
uh, the importance of publications and four-star publications, so journal articles and or monographs. And of course, if you, you're looking at hiring and you're someone who's come through a postdoc or a couple of postdocs even, um, that's going to be, you're going to be expected to have him, had more on your CV than somebody who's just finished a PhD. Um, so this is, this is all important. Uh, also, you, you should have some thought about impact. Nobody's going to be expect you to have particular impact at this point in, in time, but to have some thinking about how it might be achieved and in your next research project, not necessarily in this one. Second point is around teaching. Um, teaching research and admin ratios vary depending upon the university. Some will have higher um, research ratios than others. Others will put teaching and research at the same ratio. Um, but there isn't a, a university today where teaching does not matter. And I think that's really important to underline. Don't be scared to be enthusiastic about teaching. It matters. Um, heads can smell out applicants who don't like students or see them as unimportant. Um, so don't be afraid to talk about teaching. Some teacher, some universities may ask you for a teaching qualification. So if you have the op option to take one while you're doing your, your DPhil or doing a postdoc, do try and take that up. But most of them will provide you with the opportunity to do that once you're hired. Ideally, people and heads are looking for somebody who's got enough teaching experience that they can more or less hit the ground running. In other words, so with support and mentorship, of course, but having had some experience at various different levels, you don't have to have taught masses, but you have to have had some experience at lecturing, some experience at, at seminars, and maybe a little bit of experience at workshops and teaching. Just some, some experience really, really matters and be able to speak to it and give some concrete examples about it. Um, if it's a teaching only position, of course, it's a replacement teaching only, then there's going to be more emphasis on the teaching and you may be asked much more about innovative assessments or, or you know, pedagogical developments. So something else, of course, that's due to COVID, um, and that is that um, everybody's had to learn to teach online. And, this, and so you may need to think about and hopefully get some experience of hybrid teaching, online teaching, as well as, as in-person teaching. And final comment for this is I've talked about community. And this is really something to think about as you're, you're building things up. What else can you offer to an institution? Why would you make a good colleague? What can you do? Are you involved in developing networks? Are you involved in mentoring? Do you have some skills that can be offered that help with collegiality? So things that you can build up over time that might be really, really useful um, on a wider scale when you're looking at, at applying for a position. And I think I'll leave it right there. Elaine, thank you very much indeed. Um, before we go on, Matthew's got um, something, uh, he's going to move on, us, move us on to the next section in a moment. I'll just add now, we've got the chat and it's great to see everybody chatting. It's lovely to see people from uh, all over the place um, and introducing themselves through the chat function. We've also got the Q&A. If you'd like to put a question, I mean, the, the, the point of today's session is very much to try and answer the questions that you've got. So if you've got any question for the panelists, pop them into the Q&A. We've got plenty of dedicated time where I'll be feeding these in, but do start using that now and do start popping things in there if you want to um, direct something specifically to the panel. Um, but just before we move on, um, Matthew and Julian, any comments so far on what, um, there we go, let's Julian uh, respond to Elaine. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, wonderful to be here with everybody and I'm so pleased to be joining Elaine and Matthew and Emma for this session. Um, I, I had two really sort of general background things just to gloss and add to the very um, rich set of advice that Elaine's already given you. Um, one is that of course it's, it's a very volatile and difficult time in um, UK HE and I'm really conscious that everybody who's decided to join this um, call today will doubtless have anxieties and stresses and concerns and questions and worries and we're not going to be able to address all of those today because those are large and complicated issues in our sector and um, those large and complicated issues um, for humanities disciplines in general both in North America and in the UK and all all of that is understood very much by Elaine and Emma and myself and Matthew and um, so I'm hoping that, that our contributions today are are, are just helping you understand and reflect and think through those anxieties and questions and, and aspirations that you have. The other thing, just really background, is, is just to sort of stop and think. 
this was borne in on me by one of my senior colleagues in my Durham days several years ago, and it really made me think. A colleague said to me when we were discussing preparing for a post in the department, there was a new post being given to us by the faculty. A colleague said, remember, Julian, that um, this is two million pounds, at least, that the university is putting into this, because it's a permanent position in history. That's two million pounds, potentially, of investment from that institution into you know, if you start at the beginning of your career and stay until you retire, that will be two million pounds. So it's a really big deal, um, a permanent position. Um, and it's a big deal for the department that you're joining. It's a big deal for the institution as a whole. And so people in departments who are part of the, the discussion that's informing what the head of department's doing, the head of department is having to think about making their case and negotiating with their head of faculty or their or the head of school or, or the pro vice chancellor whoever that is there's a whole set of conversations and considerations about what that very very big investment means and it can mean that, that in a subject like history the department's wanting to diversify a little bit it can mean that the department's wanting to consolidate and it can mean um, a, a bit of both of those things. It, it can mean that a very strong and popular area like British or American history, where we've always got lots of students bursting at the seams of people wanting to do dissertations in those areas. We're wanting to consolidate and strengthen, but at the same time, we're wanting to be able to make the case to the people right at the top of the university that we've got strategic ambition, that we've got vision, that we've got a sense of direction and for us well maybe we're consolidating american history as we do so we're trying to really embrace new themes in american history or maybe we're, we're expanding geographically in a different way so there's there's lots and lots of thought processes that go on in in between in conversation between you know somebody like elaine or me and our senior colleague who's going to be deciding whether or not they buy our strategic vision and then there's loads of conversations between us and our colleagues in the department, the Director of Teaching and Learning, Matthew, is going to say, I just need someone who's going to teach really well. The Director of Research is going to say, I just need somebody who's going to look like they're going to have impact in five years' time. And then lots of other colleagues will say, oh, we, really, we haven't got enough people doing South America. I mean, is this not the time to do South America in our department? And then other people will say, is this not the time to really consolidate North America in our department? Do not underestimate just how seriously colleagues really have those conversations and, and, and as we sort of shape the strategy for the post collectively. But we, we you know, if it's a well-run department, then those conversations will have happened at the higher level, at the local level in the department, and they'll be informing the way, hopefully, we've written the job ad. They'll be informing, as Elaine says, the way the further, the further particulars are laid out and the essential criteria. And that's your key in, and because you're going to be writing into a conversation that's happened in that institution on multiple levels to win what is two million pounds of funding brilliant <laughs> thanks ever so much julian thanks for thanks very much for, for that and i very much echo what um, julian is saying there. i'm going to move on now because we do want to keep to time and matthew's going to speak so part of the planning for applying for a job really does start long before the moment of breaching the third or the second half of your final year. Matthew's going to talk us a little bit about the planning and preparation that you might do before you get to that stage. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone, and, and thanks for, for, for joining us. Um, I suppose one question, uh, as Sam says, is, is kind of when to start applying. And when you look at permanent jobs, uh, when a department is engaged in long listing and short listing, you'll find that it's quite a diverse field. And there will be very early career people. There'll be um, people who've had postdocs. There'll be people in permanent positions at other institutions that are looking to move. Um, and it, this is kind of priced in, and it, it, it's not simply the longest CV that, that, that's the most attractive to a department. Um, at Durham, we, we've made appointments in recent years for people who have not yet completed their doctorates. So, you know, in terms of thinking about when to apply, it's not unreasonable to apply before you've, you've got the doctorate in hand, but you do need to be careful. And I think it's, it's worth sort of not going too early. Um, when departments are appointing a new colleague, they're usually going to want those colleagues to do very specific things very quickly when they arrive. And that might be designing new modules and lots of lectures to write. And it might be very difficult to combine that with completing a doctorate if you're in the final stages. But if you can demonstrate in your application that you are very close to completion, that you're either completing corrections and revisions after a viva or that you know, you're, you're imminently about to submit the, the thesis and the viva is, is already booked, um, then, then you're absolutely credible and, and, and you're someone that will be considered. Um, 
beyond the doctorate in the relevant fields, uh, and Elaine played this up at the start, I think that there are several things that, that, that panels are looking for, and these are things that you should be planning to, to sort of develop over the course of your doctoral studies and, and your early careers beyond that. Obviously, research and publications is a big one. Uh, obviously, teaching is a big one. Um, but, but other things, and, and Elaine touched on several of these, but... Um, uh, outreach, you know, presenting your work to wider audiences, um, engagement with the EDI agenda, equality, diversity and inclusion, um, widening participation work. Um, all of this stuff is, is part of collegiality, it's part of being in an academic community, uh, and they speak to the responsibilities that members of the department have once they're in post. Um, so you know, different candidates will have different combinations of strengths, um, and this will partly depend on your experience, um, and it will partly depend on the academic system that you've come through. Obviously, we've got a, a very international uh, group of people in the audience here today. Uh, so it's worth thinking about this early on. And um, I think it's worth thinking about it so that you can plan, so that you're not trying to do everything at once. Um, you know, you can't allow CV building to kind of crowd out completing the doctorate uh, because that's, that's sort of, of the first order of importance. So to take these just sort of quickly in order, I mean, publications, I think this is definitely something to think about early on. Um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that it can take quite a long time for a journal article to come out. Editors are uh, reliant on reviewers to read and comment on submissions, and this process isn't always very swift. Um, you don't need a publication to be in print to be considered, um, but the closer you are to that stage, the better. Um, if you can demonstrate that you've submitted to a journal, that's great. If you've had positive feedback from, from reviewers and from editors, even better. If it's been accepted for publication, uh, better still. Um, but there's also a value to doing this for its own sake, kind of quite apart from the question of, of academic CV building. Um, you know, if you're submitting to journals, uh, you, you're, you're presenting your work to specialists that aren't your supervisor, that aren't your mentor, that aren't in your department, and you can, when the process works as it's supposed to, get really invaluable feedback that might shape the development of your doctoral or postdoctoral research. Um, now, of course, you can't launch into this immediately at the start of a PhD. You do need to build up some momentum. You need a critical mass of, of research under your belt. Um, and you need to think carefully about what you want to publish and why? What work do you want this, this article to do for you professionally? Is it about putting down a marker, um, presenting some aspect of your work to an audience as a, a kind of taster for a bigger project that's going to follow, uh, you know, the final PhD thesis, perhaps that's going to be published in uh, a monograph or in, in some other form? Um, or might an article be a kind of spin-off or a side project that as a, doesn't otherwise sit comfortably in the PhD thesis, but, but might stand on its own legs? Um, and you need to think about where you're going to pitch these, these articles. Um, this is obviously something to discuss with a supervisor, with other mentors that you've got access to. Um, you need to think about who you want to engage, who you want to speak to. Um, are you looking for a kind of big, prestigious, high-impact journal? Um, are you looking to, to publish in a more specialist journal where you'll be talking to the people in your field that you really want to engage uh, as part of the scholarly community? Um, and editors themselves can advise on this. Sometimes you'll submit to a journal and editors will say, yeah, we think this is great, it's, it's not quite the right fit for us, but have you considered X journal instead? Um, as you get closer to the end of a PhD, you obviously want to think about what you do with the thesis, what you do after the viva. Um, I think we might come back to this point later, later today. Um, but, you know, is it going to be a monograph? Are you going to try and publish it in another form? Um, and, and again, it's worth planning ahead here. Um, getting into conversations, if you can get expressions of interest from an academic press or from an editor, um, you can demonstrate that there's a kind of momentum here, there's an intellectual trajectory, and that there's a plan for further publication. Um, but the other, other big part of the job, uh, as Lane said right at the start, is, is teaching. Uh, and again, this is something to think about early in the PhD, how you can gain relevant experience, um, when you should try to get it, and how much you should take on. Um, because teaching can take different forms. Again, it depends on the department you're in, it depends on the system you're coming through. Usually it's seminar teaching, there may be opportunities for, to deliver lectures. Often, when you start out, you'll be plugging into a pre-existing module that's been designed by other colleagues. You might be joining a team of, of tutors, you might be providing substitute cover. Um, but when you're in a permanent job, you'll be invited to kind of design your own modules. Um, and so there's a chance to reflect early on about that process of, of module design, what makes a good module, how are they organized, how do they fit into a, a broader curriculum. Uh, I suppose the other thing to sort of flag up is just the point that your know, teaching's fun uh, and, and it's 
one of the parts of the job that's, that's most appealing. Um, but it's also very time consuming. Uh, and I think most PhD students, when they start teaching, uh, and this was certainly true of me, is, you know, we tend to over prepare. And you know, every hour of seminar teaching requires potentially many hours of, of reading and planning and preparation. And obviously that's, that's perfectly natural. We want to do the best for our students. Uh, but it does mean it's, it's important to be careful about how much teaching you're taking on while you're doing a doctorate. Um, you, know, you do need to balance this with your other responsibilities. Uh, and above all, you need to maintain momentum with your doctoral research. Um, there are other points I could raise, but perhaps I'll give others a chance to talk and, and we can revisit some of those later. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew. Yes, I, I really wholeheartedly agree that um, at the stage of looking at applications, we, we usually now can select from people who will have some teaching experience and will have made some strides with their publications. Um, and in addition, will very often have some other string to their bow around decolonizing the curriculum or open access, uh, um, uh, widened participation or some thought of some, some impact agenda or some other thing that they're doing as well. Um, so these things all take time. They can't be started in the last few months of a PhD. They do need kind of thinking about fairly early on, but also just to reinforce what Matthew's saying, it, it requires balance because at the same time, getting that PhD done in a timely fashion is also of critical importance. So there's a lot here to start thinking about and weighing up um, fairly early on in a PhD. And of course, your supervisor um, and your supervisors, in fact, you almost always have access to more than one supervisor today, is on hand to help you kind of navigate this terrain. I wonder if Elaine or Julian want to comment or pick up on any of Matthew's points before we move on finally um, to Julian. Can I just point out, now, you've already more or less said this, Emma, but I really want to stress the importance of talking through with your supervisor, especially for amounts of teaching because um, you, your supervisor will be really, really useful in that and often is a, involved in helping plan the teaching and can give you both instructions on how to help you plan and how to help you uh, manipulate you know, curriculum or design curriculum, but also just to make sure and say, no, no, there is no way in the world you're gonna take on that much or you're never gonna get anything done. You know, so you really, really use your supervisors for help because they can be incredibly useful. Absolutely. And just to reinforce again, it does take so much more time doing that preparation in the early days um, than you could ever possibly have, uh, have imagined. And so it is a big, it's a significant undertaking and something to be thought about carefully. All right, we are going to uh, move on to Julie. And we've been talking a little bit here about things that you might be doing fairly early on in the PhD. Um, well, before you get to the end, Julie is going to take us to the end of this session by thinking a little bit about the kind of the immediate end of the PhD and what you might do in that window there. Julian, over to you. Thanks so much. We, um, we've also got some questions coming through in the Q&A and um, I, I actually just typed a quick answer to one quite specific one, but several of them kind of blend together and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll... I'll take all I'll take all the questions at a time. I just yeah. use the moment to say what you're going to do and I'll feed as many as I can to you all. Yeah. So what I was just going to say is that some of them feed into the points I'm going to make now. And I, I'm only going to talk really quickly now because I've got another slot later as well. But the, the, the precise question I've asked to speak to was um, the year or, or, or year and a half after the PhD, if you're in that stage and perhaps you're in a one year post um, doing some teaching on, on a, on a short term contract somewhere and, you're, and, and you've got an opportunity to apply for a permanent position, um, that's where two things will have been happening. One is you'll have taken on more significant responsibilities for teaching than you'd have had the opportunity to as a PhD student. And there's there's already been mentioned the opportunity to get a qualification. Sometimes that's the HEA Advanced HE Fellowship. And um, sometimes you might be able to, if, if it's a fairly short term thing you're doing, you, you, you might be able to get an associate fellowship of that. What's really useful with all of those kinds of things, if you're in that um, one or two year position after the doctorate, doing some teaching somewhere, is that it gives you the chance to show that you're thinking about how to teach and reflecting in a process with peer review with a with a with, a, with an um, undergraduate teaching director like Matthew say or, or with a subject head that you're that you're becoming a reflective teacher 
and that that reflexivity if you like i think is a really important thing and and if you're in that career stage you have an opportunity to do that and you have an opportunity when you're starting to think about applying to reflect on how you've done that and show a panel how you have been reflecting on your teaching how you've adapted and changed and learned the other thing on the research side is that um, panels will be hoping to see um, that you've really made a big step away from nailing down a PhD, which is a task in itself and a project management task, which is pretty tight and, 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 and important that it's completed, but that you've moved on from that to be able to start to craft your vision for who you are as a historian over the next five, 10, um, you know, 15 or 20 years. It'll be very difficult to imagine who you are as a historian in 20 years, but um, it's a time when you, 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 you're, you can, I think, step away from the precise focus of the PhD and think, you know, what would I like potentially be do, to be doing if all the stars lined up for me, what would I like to be writing about in five, six, seven years time? And that's a thought process that, I mean, I might come back to that a little bit later in our second session, actually, when, when I have a slot again. That's a thought process that you should be really putting up at the top of your mind, being ambitious for yourself and, um, and being creative and, and, and trying out one or two new angles um, so that you're starting to craft the potential for a, for a longer term project but above all, that you're starting to think of yourself as somebody who's going to be um, a real pillar for the department where you might wind up working five, ten years from now. That's something that we'll come back to, but it's something that, that, that certainly, um, I know I as a head of department, I'm really interested in trying to suss out when I'm reading applications from somebody who's two years out of their PhD. Have they made that transition to thinking really longer term, and are they starting to be able to present themselves in that way? That, that sort of picks up some of the questions a little bit, but we need to go into them in, in more detail, as you say, Emma. Brilliant. So um, just before we go open up the floor to the questions, then Elaine or Matthew, any responses or any follow up from Julian's point? No, that's fine. Let's move on then. OK, so lots of questions are starting to come into the chat. We've got another, we've got 20 minutes or so to um, address these and I'll invite um, both well, all three, all three of our panelists to refer to them. Um, there's a whole set of questions that um, cover something slightly similar, and I, I thought maybe this would be a good place to begin. And that is around um, students or PhD students with different kinds of um, backgrounds and different kinds of experiences. Um, so there's one about um, students with a BAME background, others coming from overseas or international backgrounds, um, others coming from experience maybe with teaching in schools as a mature student, um, other, other experiences that are kind of outside the, the specific context of the British University. I wonder if our um, panel would like to speak to how they think um, these different alternative backgrounds um, may, or may, may fare in the um, job application uh, process and how, how departments look on these different backgrounds. Go ahead, anybody. I'm just looking at the questions for the moment. Um, in terms of, of, of international, well, basically in terms of, of somebody who's coming in from an outside system, I think the, the key thing there is, is in, in a sense, very much the same kind of thing that I've already said is make sure that you look done your homework because the systems are different, but there are lots of similarities, but you have to actually identify what's going on in, in terms of the British system and how you can then fit into it. Um, ideally, if you've got some networks that you, you can use to, to draw on your networks and get them to give you a hand and also get in touch with the department, you know, talk to people, what are you actually looking for? There's always gonna be a contact, usually if it's the head of department, but it might, might be someone else in the department, get in touch with and say, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this and this is the way I'm understanding what you've written. Is that actually what you mean? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll oh, sorry, Matthew's got his hand up. Go, Matthew. Uh, well, uh, sorry, yeah, just to absolutely agree with what Lane's saying. And um, I mean, it's part of your demonstrating your ability to kind of step in and perform the job. If you understand you know, how teaching works in 
whatever it is in English context um, uh, or your particular type of history department. Um, but, but it also um, adds quite a lot to an application when you can demonstrate that you're bringing something to the intellectual diversity of the department, um, whether that's internationalism, whether it's, um, I mean, we have a, a first generation scholars group at Durham. We have people that have, have been very active in, in, in widening participation, partly because it's something that they feel they've benefited from themselves. So, so you did, all of these in different ways can strengthen an application. And I think that they're worth kind of leaning into and emphasizing. Yeah, I think lots and lots of history departments in the UK are wanting to um, teach and research in a way that is more diverse and more global and more inclusive and uh, to be able to develop a staff base that reflects that aspiration is critically important for us all. But um, just as just as with anything, if, if, if you are wanting to work within a system where you're going to arrive and start teaching first year undergraduates, second year undergraduates, master's students, it's really important that you understand what those processes are and we make the same point to um, colleagues um, uh, you know if I get rung up say or emailed by somebody from the States who's wanting to apply for a job um, then then a piece of advice I always give as Elaine says is, is also do the homework on the British system in terms of research so find out as much as you can about funding in the UK and how that works so it's about doing the homework but it's, but it's about understanding that I think our process, our, our profession is really um, is really hoping that as a discipline in the UK, we, we, are, we are global and inclusive in, in, in our outlook. And that means being global and inclusive in our staff base. So, you know, when people are in touch, uh, I guess one of the jobs of the head of department is to try and help as much as possible to how you might do your homework. So, um, but applications that, that, that are cognizant of just a sense of what it's like to teach in our system and to be researching in our system. And then we can, we can help and we can give advice about how you might go about that. Yes, I would really underscore um, what all three of our panelists have said there. I think there is a real um, desire to diversify historical depart history departments in the UK at the moment. Um, and having a, 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 a slightly different or unusual or a, or a less than direct path to the moat to where you are at this point to, to not be age 27 and have gone straight in from school is not a disadvantage you may have many different kinds of backgrounds and I think just to underscore what Julian's saying um it's just about maybe making that relevant so there's no certainly no reason to um hide that that certainly should be something that you feel that you can talk about um and to, uh, and to explain why you're talking about it what that helps you to bring to a particular department so I think all of the things that I spotted coming up in the um um, question uh, in the Q&A about being a mature student, having a BAME background, coming from overseas, having maybe done adult education rather than having done university education. These are all things that could be benefits and we would just want to see um, why you think that's a benefit to this particular role in this particular job. So let's move on. Other um, series of questions around, um, well, I, mean, I think there's one about, there's some questions about route um, going from PhD to postdoc permanent and I think there are no clear answers here as to quite when is the right moment to apply for the job but I'd encourage the um, panel to speak to that when is the right moment do you need to do a postdoc first can you go straight to permanent what thoughts and wisdoms uh, have you got around this um, set of questions okay I'll, I'll, I'll start there um, when do you apply for a job um, first of all I would suggest you know the, unless the to think again it's take a look at the essential criteria if it says you shalt have thou shalt have a PhD then either give them a phone call and say look I've got my viva scheduled for two weeks after your closing date will you accept me um, or basically don't you know wait don't waste your time if they're if they're not willing to accept it so check check what's what's actually being asked of you um do you need to have a postdoc or not a few years ago most people wouldn't have done postdocs because there weren't really that many of them around there are increasingly postdocs and research assistantships that people are getting that are tied to uh, funding applications i would say take a look at whatever's available and if there's a job going in your area and you're ready to apply for it, you, you, you know, you've got your PhD submitted at least, um, or you, you're right in that stage, go for it. If there is a, a, a research assistantship, PDRA, or a, um, a, a postdoc of some sort that is in an area that would be really good for you, 
you know, there's no reason why not get your foot in the door. And that always helps because it gives you experience. You get you know, the opportunity to gain extra publications. Uh, perfectly all right. So I don't think there is an easy answer of saying that you have to have a postdoc. You don't, although it will give you more experience uh, usually. But it's there's no reason why you can't simply apply straight from post from PhD as well. Um, Emma, I was just going to pick up the question from a colleague in, in the States um, about, actually, no, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll save that because I'm going to talk about the letter um, in the second half. So we'll pick that one up later. But I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I really endorse the, 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 the breadth of experience being useful to us and people who've done different kinds of work can 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 bring a kind of a different sort of depth of experience to the classroom that's really super useful in a teaching community and um i think i think that just brings strength there's a couple of questions emma about right. um, um thank you very much julian thank you for that um matthew do you have anything to oh, oh it's probably a bit easier julian if i feed the questions in and you can just sit there and relax and see what i throw at you um, um, I mean, just just yeah the, the, i guess the question is you know what, what do you do if there are not many opportunities immediately after the phd and yeah i mean that's a situation that we often find ourselves in that, you know sometimes these opportunities are there and, and sometimes they're just not so so there are different um different ways of kind of using that time if you're still interested in an academic career further down the path i mean it, it's often possible to pick up sort of smaller amounts of flexible teaching um but obviously we need to be careful about precarious employment and you know we, you need to sort of think about um options that are open to you, not just within, but also uh, beyond academia. Um, but you know, if, if you're applying for a permanent job, having taken a year or two out, um, I think it just address it in the cover letter, kind of explain what you've been doing with this year. Um, because even if you're not being employed teaching, you can still uh, reflect on what you want to do with your, your kind of publication agenda. You can think about, as Julian said earlier, what the next big project is going to be. Um, you can sort of um, uh, think about the kind of longer term trajectory of, of where you want to go. Um, so I think, you know, don't sort of hide from it. I think it's, it's fine to acknowledge it. And, and, you know, selection committees know how, how tough it is at the moment and, and know that these opportunities are not there for everyone who, who needs or deserves them. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so there's some specific questions about um, what, what should be sitting on the CV and what would make the most compelling um, kind of basket of goods that you offer in a way. And one of them is around and some about teaching, some about research, some about the other things. So let's take them one by one. Um, starting with teaching, somebody has asked, um, what's more valuable, um, a contract for a book or uh, one good peer-reviewed article? I think um, very often there is no, obviously, correct answer to these kinds of questions, but I think it is a really good thing to start thinking about. What kind of, what kind of research offering should we have on the page when we're starting to apply for jobs? What, what, what looks good? And um, that, that contrast between going for various forms of articles or essays in collections versus a book contract, I think is one that's very relevant for our discipline. So any thoughts on that one? Um, okay, uh, in terms of, of um, publications, I've talked to a number of different people about this one, just to make sure that the kind of thing that I would be expecting isn't just me. Um, and effectively what's coming out across the board from the people that I talked to, and this was a, a good handful of heads across the country, is that there isn't a specific answer. Um, and if early in the ref uh, cycle, they really are keen on having one good, strong article in a, in a good peer reviewed journal. That's, that was the thing. And, and showing promise of research. That's really promise of research trajectory was the thing that, that everybody was looking for. Um, a four star article is brilliant, you know, um, better have a four star article than, than a one star uh, piece put into a collection from a, um, uh, from a, a conference, uh, you know, that's not published by somebody reputable. Um, if we're moving later into the ref cycle and you've got um, you've got a monograph, that's absolutely fantastic. But most people who are coming directly out of a PhD will not. So I don't think you have to panic and think, oh, God, I've got to have a, a, a book out there. What you do want is to show promise of good research. So one good piece in, in, a, in, a, in a good collection, um, in, a, in a peer reviewed uh, journal is is absolutely fine but also if you can be specific 
about what you are doing. So if you're, you know, you've taken that year out and you're putting that PhD into, into a monograph and you've got a contract, say that. Make sure that you make that clear. If you've got another journal article that is just about ready to go and you're going to submit it in a month and you know that's going to happen, say that. If you've got something that's in press already and it's done the copy editing stage, say that. It's, it's these kinds of things that are really, we're looking for potential as much as, as what's actually on the board, especially at the beginning of a rough cycle. Very true, Elaine. I really agree with that. Uh, Julian, go ahead. Oh yeah, but I, I had a reflection which I guess builds on that. The 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 rules for how ref worked, m many of you might know or maybe you don't know, they changed quite significantly before the last ref. About you know the the new the new rules came out what four years ago, and in the olden days we were all all of us in permanent posts where we were being returned. We had to submit four things. That's changed, and now people submit between one and five things, and I I felt that. On the whole, this was probably really positive for historians because it means that it means that you can focus more on working as a team in your department, and you're going to be focusing definitely on quality, not quantity. So there is no sense of um, you know weighing up. This person has got four things. This person has got seven things. Really, what we're trying to discern is is the quality, and see you know one or two things that look incredibly interesting and, and thought provoking and obviously the person who's written that one thing is now ambitious for and it's going to be even more exciting rather than somebody who maybe is in you know in demand and and responding to friends in different parts of the country other other countries and, and writing lots of slightly shorter things that are not quite as exciting so we're, we're really looking for the exciting promise as elaine says that's absolutely right but the, the newer ref system I think probably pushes us to feel that even more strongly than it did in the past, maybe. I think that's right. Um, I mean, there's, there's really, it is a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. There are lots of different ways of publishing and sharing your work. Um, and I think particularly in our discipline, the peer reviewed article and the monograph are the two things that are up there of particular significance. Having said that, edited collect essays in edited collections can also be a, a sign of being part of a community of scholars and they can be a very important contributions. So we're in no way saying that these are less so in any kind of way. And I, I think just following on, on something that Elaine said, CVs can often have a lot of work that's in preparation and under review and in various, and I think it's very important to indicate where stuff is in preparation and under review. Um, but there is a big difference between all of the things that are under contract, even books that are under contract, and the thing that is actually delivered, um, a peer reviewed article will usually have gone through a lot of hoops. And if it's actually been accepted and it's actually coming out, you've got a, a kind of external validation of what you're doing that some of the other things that we're, we're talking about doesn't have quite that same degree of external validation. Um, but again, take all of these kinds of questions to your supervisors who ought to be kind of very well placed to say which is, you know, what might be a priority for you at this particular time. So just moving on to this family of questions around um, uh, research and publications that we've got and teaching and the other things that we've been talking about. Let's just move on to the teaching. So one of the questions that's come in is about how much teaching, how, how much teaching is, is, is the right amount. And again, I think it is a bit no, um, you know, how long is a piece of string, but it is also a very good question as to, 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 to what do we mean by having some evidence of teaching on your um, CV, uh, anyone for that one? Should I jump in on that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, as I say, it, it's a, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is a panel's a piece of string question. Uh, and there's a slight tension between different impulses there. As you said, yeah, there's a high startup cost the first time you deliver teaching. So there's always a sort of an incentive to repeat it because you get a return on that investment. Um, but you've got to think about what value is being added there and, and kind of what kind of teacher can you present yourself as being on the CV. Now, on one level that operates in terms of you know, a list of modules that you've taught, and that says something about the type of historian you are, and it gives departments a sense of where you might plug in. Um, but it's also a reflection of the system you're in and the opportunities open to you. So you can kind of contextualize this in, in I know Julian's gonna talk about the cover letter a bit later, uh, but you can kind of talk a little bit about how you approach teaching and how you try to make the most of the opportunities open to you. Um, if there is a chance to teach more than one type of module, um, in a sense, you kind of increase your um, credibility for different types of job that might be advertised. Um, 
and there's the question of, of, of different modes of teaching, which Elaine mentioned at the start. So, I mean, often it's it's seminar teaching. Um, and if someone's got a lot of seminar teaching, a department might want to know, well, you know, can, can you also lecture? Um, and, you know, can you demonstrate if you haven't had that opportunity that you're aware of, of how lecturing is different from seminar teaching or from running a workshop or how you know, teaching a level one module might be different from teaching final year students or supervising a dissertation. Um, so it's, it's yeah, I, mean, I think Julian used the word kind of reflective earlier. I think that's exactly right. It's, it's about kind of what you do with the experience uh, as much as how much of it that you have. Add Julian. That's, I mean, I, I agree entirely that I once had a very, so I had started my career teaching in a school, in fact, and I had a slightly tough head teacher who once told me a story about somebody who'd said, I've got 35 years experience. And he said, I'm not so sure. I think you've had one year's experience, which you've repeated 35 times. And I think that somebody who's had limited teaching opportunities, but is saying really sensitive things about what they've done, how they've taken ownership of it, how they've reflected on it, how they've sought out peer review and, and different kinds of feedback from, from colleagues to build. You, you can say quite a lot with really quite a little, actually. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's simply because the opportunities do vary a lot from department to department. Some of you will be in places where actually the department would love you to do loads of teaching, and some of you will be in places where there, there actually isn't so much to go around, and so it's really quite rationed. And, and I think, every, I think you know, heads of department and, and Matthew and people, we're all really mindful of that. So we can't privilege somebody who's got loads of teaching over somebody who's only done a tiny bit. It's, it, we're really looking for the kind of quality reflection. I would really underscore what Julian has said there. Yes, di different departments do offer different kinds of amount of teaching. And it, it can sometimes look when a job advert goes up in the world that it, it looks as though they want everything. Um, uh, and in reality, you're going to be looked at as a your application is going to be looked at by a panel of ordinary people like us who are realistic and understand that not everybody is going to have everything. Um, and you just need to speak intelligently about what you have done. And you can point, you can use your cover letter to point out opportunities that you haven't had um, and the things that you, 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 you can you can you can rationalize, talk a little bit around some of the things that you have and haven't done in the cover letter and just take the space there to explain what you bring. And as Julian says, it's about the intelligent reflection on what you have done. So you may not have the precise form of teaching that you are going to have to do in this job, but if you have got some form of teaching experience and you can explain why that is relevant for this job that's been advertised, that will be something that's interesting and convincing to a panel. All right, we're gonna stop in a few minutes, but I'll just put the last um, couple of questions um, that, um, that kind of touch on that other side of things that you might talk about that you might be able to do. So one question turns on um, impact and outreach and what is meant there. And could we just say a little bit more about what that impact and outreach might be? And uh, Elaine, somebody else has picked up on the fact that Elaine talked about all the other forms of contribution. I think it all, several of us in various ways have talked about the other forms of contribution. You're going to contribute to this department with your teaching and your research, but you're hopefully going to be a good citizen. Um, what else um, might you be able to talk about and what, what other kind of experiences might you have? So I just wonder if the panel could um, elaborate on that a little bit for us. Um, well, one thing about citizenship, there's actually um, a kind of connection through to research strategy and planning here because um, if we're thinking about your plans for developing um, research funding applications, what that ultimately is about is about collaborating with other researchers. And there's something around, you know, you, you may feel that this is some way off and that's okay, but there's something around um, in, in two or three years, once I've got over the next little hurdle of getting my book out or getting my next couple of, what I then want to do is I know I've got a colleague in Edinburgh who I'm really close to and we've got a big plan and what we need is two more people who work in slightly different areas I want to build a little the beginnings of a network and, and, and actually there's a whole thing there around talking about you as a collaborator which is actually really important for the more instrumentalist of, of, of our sort of you know bits of brain as heads of department because we, we, we're often given targets for, for research funding. And so people being able to talk intelligently about research funding is important. But what it comes down to is, do you, do you have the beginnings of thinking as a research collaborator? 
And so that, that then, of course, if you step back from that, that feeds into the whole wider thing of how do you work with other people? And, and we can tell because people can write really intelligently about all kinds of ways in which they work well as, t as team members, supporting each other. Um, uh, you know, what, what early career networks have you um, been part of? Have you started one? Have you joined one? Um, have you taken ownership of one? Could be around EDI, it could be around um, uh, activities where three or four of you in a department are working in schools outreach. All of this is, is good, and, and, but one of the reasons it's good is that, is that as a career develops, Collaboration is really, really important in, in those different ways. Absolutely. Can I just reinforce that and underline it twice? I think that's, that's superbly important. And one of the things as well is, is if we're thinking about things that you might have done while you were doing your doctorate, um, getting involved in um, uh, subject specialist organizations, helping plan conferences, working on seminars or hosting seminars, building networks, Works because those kinds of networks are going to be absolutely crucial as you go on in your career to be able to allow you to build panels for conferences to start the kind of actually funding applications that um, that that we're speaking about here. All of that kind of work is there. Also, the kind of thing that might be some kind of, a, of extension work that you might have done. So uh, Julian's talked about you know, working with schools. You might have done some work with, with uh, museums, for instance, in the heritage sector, um, you know, working with um, uh, disadvantaged groups or refugee groups or you, you name it. All, the, all kinds of things that can be outreach may be turned to your advantage as you're putting together your application. So bring your own special interests to your application because your special interests are things you can develop to develop your career and to, to develop your research um, later on. And, they, and they're, they're pluses for any department. Brilliant. Um, did you have anything to add, Matthew? Uh, no need if not. Yep. Great. I think that just there is just to say, you know, to repeat what both Julian and Elaine are saying, there's it doesn't matter what that third thing is. So we, we definitely want some evidence of some teaching. We definitely want some evidence of some research. We'd like to see some evidence of something else. And we're in no way or we're on you. Know, we're not usually prescriptive. Of course, if this is a job for public history, then that other thing is probably going to need some kind of impact, some kind of public history dimension to it. If it's a job with a specific interest in race, you may well want to have something around that banner for your other thing. But usually uh, a lot of jobs, if it's, a, if it's a standard academic job that's one particular subject and it doesn't specify some other particular uh, branch, then it doesn't matter what that third thing is. What we're looking for is the evidence of the rounded scholar, some kind of network around some kind of theme, it could be impact, it could be outreach, it could be any other kind of intellectual or political or activist uh, network, it really doesn't matter, but some evidence that you bring something else and that you're prepared to collaborate, that you know other people in the field, that you do other things, that you can speak to other audiences at other times. Um, and, and I would really just, just, just say again, there's, there's, there's no precise recipe there. Uh, and unless you're going for a job that does mandate what that other thing is, um, I would say the world is your oyster and just follow your um, your interests and, 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 and your, your kind of proclivities and just be able to speak to that at the application stage. All right, we're practically on the hour, so we're going to um, take a short pause here. We'll um, restart at five past. Um, carry on adding your things into the question and answer. When we come back, there's a whole family of questions that I do recognise there about um, what qualifies you to apply for what job and we'll come back to this I'll pick up on all the major themes as best I can in the Q&A when we come back um, but for now carry on putting your thoughts in there we're going to come back we'll be focusing a little bit more explicitly on the moment of writing a cover letter and um, preparing for an interview and kind of going going in front of these people who are going to make the appointment um, so that's the theme for the second half but take a break go get a cup of tea I'll see everybody back here um, in five minutes Hello everybody, welcome back and welcome our panel back on.
Great. So our purpose in the second half is to um, think a little bit more closely about actually applying to an academic job. And Julian's going to kick us off by thinking about what makes for a good application on paper. What are you going to have to put down on paper um, that perhaps gets you to the long listing or even the short listing phase? Julian, over to you. Thanks, Emma. Um, so we are, as Emma said, living in a phase of life um, where the job market in history is tough and um, panels have a lot of applications to read. Um, I know one person asked what's the right length of a letter and that's you know also how long is a piece of string but I think three pages maybe four but probably three is good and CVs that are quite tightly constructed and that are compact and I'll give a couple of suggestions around how one might do that and if, if you think back to many of the points we were raising early on I think the first thing you need to do is to try and give the panel a sense of who you are as a scholar and not just as a historian but as a scholar because you know we want people to be able in the longer term to speak to other disciplines we want people who are going to you know in five or ten years time be writing grant applications that might be interdisciplinary that might speak to other disciplines so let's get a really high level really quick sense of who you are and why why you're passionate about being in this career in your research in your scholarly endeavors and then out of that later on will flow in the letter your commitment to teaching as that connects to who you are as a scholar and um, at the same time you're speaking into the conversation that's been going on in the department about the strategic priorities that they have for the post and you're trying to see how well you can speak to the desiderata that the department has set out and try and get a sense and you can do that by asking for a phone conversation as Elaine said um, with with the named contact on the job ad try and get a sense of is this are they really branching out here and am I going to help them do that or are they consolidating but wanting still to maintain the diversity in other ways, in thematic ways, and can I help them do that? Or am I somebody who's going to be really quite different to a lot of the people in the department, in which case how can I speak back into the groups that are already there and show that I'm going to collaborate and work well with them? So that's not to restrict your ambition in terms of writing in the first and second paragraph about Maybe you think you're going to bring something very different. Don't be put off by that if you do think that, but be able to show how you're going to work within the team, work within the curriculum. But I think that the most important thing that, that I'm trying to get a sense of is this somebody who's got a real longevity potentially as a historian working in the UK university system, somebody who's going to be having ideas in five or ten years time, don't necessarily need to know what they are, I can start to get a sense that you are that sort of person who's going to be really thinking as a scholar um, shaping the field for years to come and you're going to do that with your ambitious research program and you're going to do that with a commitment to students at all levels and you're going to do that with a commitment to bringing your work to um, audiences beyond the academy and that will be different ways as Emma was saying just before our break. So um, once you've got over that sort of first paragraph of giving us a sense of who you are um, it's probably most important to move to the to, to research in your letter and to, to show your ambition show where you're going show the big picture of where you're going and how that speaks to people in the department but how that will speak to other people in other disciplines as well and then you can say and i've begun this journey first of all with my doctorate which did this and then i've begun i've taken that journey forward with, with an article that's now sitting here and I'm developing um, a book proposal which is at this stage or I, I'm going to hold that off because I've got two more articles to write or I'm already starting to build a little network or four or five people whatever it is you're doing at that stage so we can see that you've got a big ambition but you're actually thinking practically and sensibly about what you can reasonably do at this stage fairly early in your career now so there's there's two kind of levels there isn't there there's the kind of the I've got I've got longevity as a scholar but I've also tried to be reflective and thoughtful about what I can reasonably manage to do at this stage what's reasonable for me to do and and the kind of balance of those things I think is something that we really like to see because it gives us a sense that that you're not going to try and be um, doing things that are actually going to take years and years to come to fulfillment and we might never see them and you're, you're figuring out what those steps towards that bigger ambition is going to be 
Um, I think it's important that we understand what um, you make of the funding environment for, for, for research grant applications, bearing in mind we all know how difficult it is to get research money, but it's important that you can speak into that agenda with again some pragmatic things that you might be aspiring to do in the shorter term, um, maybe network grants, maybe library visits, things like that that are just going to show you, show us that you are thinking about um, translating your ambition into applications for external funding. Um, there are of course the, the bigger well-funded ECR schemes at the, e, at the AHRC and, and, and similar um, Wellcome Trust or whatever and, and so you can be starting to think about how you might target those and um, I think it's also right that you turn that around and suggest in your letter that you'd be hoping that the institution you're applying to is going to help you be successful with those kinds of things. Um, I think that if, 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 you can, if you can get a sense of the curriculum that you're going to be teaching in and then get a sense of how you would like to contribute and shape the curriculum in ways that relate not just to specific bits of research that you have but to your wide intellectual interests as a scholar, that's exciting for us to read about and to be able to say yeah that big team taught level one module actually I've got I can already feel like I've got some great ideas I'd love to talk to the colleagues involved about and you know put my shoulders to the wheel with something creative and exciting and as part of the team of three or four people running that first year thing I'd like to hear other people's ideas I've got some ideas too. and then have I got opportunities for doing doing soul taught things higher up the curriculum or actually again am I seeking to collaborate with other colleagues in the department to teach um, if efficiently in little pairs or in threes higher up the curriculum and at master's level as well. Um, I've got mixed feelings about teaching philosophy. I see quite a lot of teaching philosophy statements and I'd be really interested to see what Matthew and Elaine say about this. I think that um, we've already made the point around showing that you are a reflective teacher, a thoughtful teacher, and philosophy is a slightly grand word. And um, I think what we love to see is the sort of show not tell thing. And that means we'd love to see you talk about how you have reflected and how you've thought rather than saying, I think about teaching in this way because I did a course and I read a textbook about pedagogy. And this is something I like to subscribe to in theoretical terms. So I really like to read practical examples of things that you've done that come to life, perhaps a little bit more than theoretical statements of intent. If you like. And maybe that maybe that thought applies also to um, points around how do you describe the work that you've already published or how do you describe the work in your PhD. Um, there are ways of talking about well my PhD seeks to do this where you talk us through the depth of thinking that's there in your PhD work quickly in probably about a paragraph tops or so and there are ways of doing that that allow us to say that really resonates um, because we can see the quality of your, your thinking as you present the deep thinking that's gone into the problem that you researched. And again, there are ways of doing that that's, that, that do show, not tell, I would say, that I certainly relate to um, more, more than um, saying, well, I've got gold stars all over the place. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice to see people who've been really successful in, in competitive competitions on one prizes. Those are really, it's really nice to see those. Um, but there's something about reading a paragraph that describes a PhD thesis really thoughtfully and, and it shows the challenge that you've taken on as an intellectual and that's what comes to life most of all for me. So I'm, I'm looking for not a long letter, maybe three three sides um, that, that covers your research and your teaching and, and then your other involvements along the lines that um, Emma was talking about earlier that shows a little bit more than telling um, and that gives us a chance to see how you've reflected on what you've learned as a teacher and where you'd like to go in the next five to ten years. We don't expect people to have a really mapped out ten year plan because that's you know over the top but we want to see from what you say about yourself and what you say about your ideas that those ideas are going and they've got real you know they've got real distance to them. I'll just finish going quickly on this on the, on the CV um, sometimes feel that and, and again session, sessions like this if we're not careful, I mean Emma was brilliant just before the break in terms of saying follow your interests don't cry don't try and cover everything and CVs that
go on for 10 or 15 pages and that have every single possible talk that you've ever given for all kinds of networks and conferences and so on, um, they almost become sort of um, difficult to read because there's so much there. And I sometimes feel like we, we, we encourage early career scholars to try and tell us everything that they're doing and try and do everything. And actually, let's think more about that sense of quality rather than quantity. So a CV that's only five or six pages long is ample for me. It's going to show me the, 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 the key outputs in research terms that are there. I want to see those near the top. It's going to show me the positions that you've had and the opportunities to teach that you've had and where there is work from outside the academy that should be listed because that's always important to have in a CV because it shows the overall scope of the career and and, and it allows us to, to fill out um, what you have done as a person, which is actually a, a kind of core HR thing that's important for us to see. Um, but I don't necessarily need to see every single conference paper. When you've had particularly exciting invitations to talk or um, particularly significant things, you can give us an indicative list of three or four of the biggest, most important talks you've had and then I think there's a section around the collaborations that you've had. And, and as Emma said, that collaborative working might be of all different kinds. And um, we're not expecting every single person to have done loads of schools outreach. We're not expecting every single person to have done lots of museum connections. But if you are that person, then your CV can show that. I think I'll just stop there because Elaine, you've read hundreds and thousands of CVs and, and, and you, you know, and Matthew too and, and Emma. So, um, People might slightly disagree or want to emphasize things slightly differently to how I have. But I hope that was helpful. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's worth emphasizing that these CVs and cover letters are all looked at by a room full of people, and we do disagree. Um, it's a normal thing that there is some disagreement as to who, who ticks all the boxes. So it's partly why we always get a panel. I don't think I don't think for a moment Julian said anything remotely um, uh, controversial there at all. Um, but the reality is, of course, opinions differ when we see these things. So I wonder if Matthew or Elaine want to pick up on anything there. And um, before we move on to Matthew, he'll be talking a little bit about um, the, the day of interview. Yeah, can it just, I mean, I guess just to underscore maybe three things, or perhaps four things that Julia mentioned. One of them is yeah, about keeping it kind of succinct and clear. And as you said, you know, it'll be looked at by a panel of people and they'll be looking at many hundreds of pages of, of, of application material. Uh, so the ability to communicate the important stuff clearly is really important. Uh, but, but I guess the three things that, that I, I think I really want to emphasize that Julian said were one was, was fit, that you want to communicate what you bring to the department, where you would fit in. Um, I mean, and that's simple things like getting the name to the institution right on the cover letter, you know, it does happen. And of course, it's, it's a slip, it can happen to anyone. But um, making sure that, that, that you've kind of proofread the cover letter, that you don't sound like you're applying for a different job, but also that the letter doesn't look generic and form like, that, that you kind of thought about what kind of department it is. Um, and not just the department, but what, what kind of institution. So are there collaborations outside history? Um, are there research networks in, in the region? Are there a kind of interdisciplinary institutes that you might want to think about? Um, the, the other point, uh, I think, or another point that Julian raised that's really important is, is kind of promising what's reasonable. And, and there's a balance to be struck between ambition and, you know, you want to, to, to be ambitious and you want to kind of look ambitious, but you don't want to look like you're over-promising or that, that um, it's, it's kind of not credible what you're planning to do. So in terms of what your kind of longer term research plan is, you know, what, what bids, what funding you're going to apply for, you can't promise to bring in, you know, a million pound grant and publish, you know, five books in an article in the first year because you're going to be doing lots of new teaching for the first time. So, yeah, that balance between ambition and kind of credibility. Um, and, and, and finally, Julian's point about kind of showing, not telling. And when, 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 when panels look at this material, you know, they're looking against a, a set of assessment criteria and they're making a judgment on how well evidenced uh, candidates are in, in, in terms of meeting those criteria. Uh, so, um, talking about how you engage with teaching rather than just listing the modules that you've taught, talking about you know, uh, where you see yourself sitting within your field rather than just listing publications, uh, it's, yeah, again, it's that reflectiveness um, and it's that kind of providing useful context, but in a kind of short, cogent and efficient way, uh, that, that, that's really invaluable to, to selection panels. Thanks so much, Elaine. Yeah, just just to, to reiterate that, yeah, give concrete examples where you can um, make sure that you are actually applying to the job that you want that that is advertised, so that it, it, that's important. And please, please, please do a spell check. 
in the Brick and Roll. So I think, I mean, just wrapping up, I think that's right. This cover, cover letter wants to cover the three things that we've been talking about. Research, which will include current research and the future of your research, the teaching, the experience you have to date and where you would go with this job or what your future teaching might be, where would you fit in this department? And the other things that we've been talking about, the stuff that you've done to date and the stuff that you will bring. And I think as everybody is saying, it's about tailoring each of those sections to this specific job. Um, so you can cover what you've done to date usually pretty quickly and pretty briskly. And then the point is, and how would this, how would this work within this particular job that we're looking at here? So a lot of tailoring, a lot of making it unique and just care with spell checks and getting people's names right. Um, it's not that we are so vain, we have to get our names right. It's just about, that just, it, it's just indicative of the amount of care. Applying for a job is, is a thing that should involve care. We will be asking you to do all sorts of things that involve care and we want to see that level of care at this stage as well. Brilliant. Um, there are more questions coming in around letters, so I'll try and pick up as many as I can at the um, a question and answer session, um, but I'll uh, hand over to Matthew now for the next um, theme. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of try to keep this reasonably brief. Um, sort of what to expect on the day. Um, uh, Elena Jr. will say a bit more about the interview panel later. Um, you, you'll be briefed if you're called to an interview on what to expect, um, and it will vary between institutions and departments. Um, so at Durham, there's usually three elements to, to the um, kind of interview process, usually spread over two days. Um, there's a research presentation, which is usually to the whole academic department. Uh, there's a teaching presentation, um, and I mean, we've had to sort of vary how we do this because of COVID, and it partly depends on, on, on when an interview is scheduled. Is it during term time? Is it during a vacation? But normally we would like to do that with a group of students to kind of replicate a, a seminar-like environment with someone like the Director of Studies sat in as an observer. Uh, and then there'll be an interview with the selection panel. Um, and, and the three elements are looking for different things. Uh, to take the kind of research talk first, um, when you've applied your application material, we looked at by a long listing committee and a short listing committee. When you do a research presentation, you'll usually be talking to a wider audience. So these are people that will not necessarily already be familiar with you or with your application. Um, so you, what you're talking to is a kind of an interested but a non-specialist audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, so part of the job, I think, is to kind of flag up key points that you've made in the application uh, in terms of who you are uh, and kind of what you're all about as a scholar. So it's about communicating where you stand in the field. It's about communicating the originality and significance of your research to people that might not be specialists within that subfield. Um, it's about uh, communicating your future plans. So, so you'll obviously talk about who you are, where you've come from, the work you've done in your doctoral dissertation, um, you know, any publications you might already have. Uh, but you'll also be using this chance to communicate your um, intellectual trajectory, where you're going next, um, what the next project is about. Um, and above all, to kind of, I think this is, this is where ambition comes in, to show that you're not just retreading old grounds, that you're building on what you've done before, but you're also moving beyond it. Uh, now, that might be that you're sort of branching out into a different subfield. It might be that you're asking bigger or more profound questions, but, but some sense that, that there's sort of more to come is, is useful. Um, and that would include potentially talking about things like funding applications, but I think above all it would, talk, it would be talking about collaborations within the department or beyond. And yeah, there may be people that would be great collaborators. They might not be on the panel for whatever reason, but there's still a chance to kind of engage with them in this, this forum. Um, I think it's important to, to kind of pitch it appropriately. And, and that means reading the briefing very, very carefully. So the, the, the letter that invites you to do will usually explain what they would like to see. But you know, if it's a research presentation, if they list certain points they want you to hit, make sure you hit them uh, and, and make sure you kind of keep to time um, because you're, you're, um, you're demonstrating your kind of capacity to communicate complexity, to communicate the significance of your work. In a sense, it, it relates to teaching. Um, but but it's also where the department will get a sense of, of who you are. So um, yeah, follow the brief. If it's a research presentation, make sure that you're talking about the right kind of research. Make sure you're covering the ground that we want to cover in a timely fashion, uh, and, and make sure that you're kind of speaking to the audience at the right level. So sort of interested but non-specialist. Um, and a lot of those points apply with the teaching presentation too. Uh, as I say, because of COVID, you know, sometimes we've had to do this in a slightly different forum in, in, in recent years that, you know, it'll be about uh, presenting a plan for a new module to academic members of staff, um, or it'll be about kind of you know, reflecting on um, 
you know, your teaching philosophy or your approach to teaching or whatever it might be. But, but normally we would like to see you in a room with students. And once again, the briefing really matters here. You know, should you be pitching something to level one students, to finalists? Um, you know, it, it may even be postgraduates, uh, depending on sort of who's available and what's being looked for. Um, have a look at the department so that you can get a sense of where the kind of teaching your offer will fit in. Um, you know, are you consolidating existing strength, as Julian said earlier? Are you potentially offering something that, that's kind of very new and therefore very different from what students have engaged with in the past? Um, I mean, it, it, at Durham, we've, we've kind of recently expanded in East Asian and South Asian history. And so we had kind of people presenting on these topics to students that had not studied this kind of history in any depth before. Um, and that meant that there was a kind of particular challenge in terms of how you bring students who normally won't have done any preparatory reading into a conversation that, that's kind of pedagogically useful. Um, I think it's important to address yourself to the students, not to the observer who's in the room, um, because it's the students that will often be handing in the, the really valuable feedback to the selection panel that, you know, that they have very kind of clear views on what they find um, useful and engaging and interesting and helpful. And, and so it's, you know, it's, it's about um, uh, fostering inquiry. It's about kind of generating enthusiasm. It, it's not about kind of trying to trip them up or catch them out. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's a chance to, to sort of do a part of the job, which is sort of absolutely central to the experience, but also, I say, usually a lot of fun. Uh, I, I won't say too much right now about the interview, because I know we're coming to it, but, but I suppose just to make the point that the three elements uh, are all connected. And so often um, people on the panel, I mean, they will have sat through the research presentation. Sometimes there's a rule that, that, that the selection panel won't ask questions in the presentation. So, you know, it's worth being prepared for that. You might think, you know, is it a really bad sign that, that the, kind of the head of the department didn't ask a question? Does that mean they're not engaged? You know, there may be particular reasons that they're, they're holding that stuff back for the interview panel later. Um, and usually they'll, they'll use the interview to kind of pick up on points that they found interesting from earlier in the process, or perhaps to, to kind of raise um, any aspects that you might not have covered as clearly in the cover letter or in, um, in, in, in the research of the teaching presentation. So if you're someone that's done seminar teaching, they might want to say, well, look, how would you approach a lecture? You know, what do you think the difference is between different forms of teaching? Uh, or, or if you're someone that's taught a lot on existing modules, you know, how do you approach designing a module of your own? So it's, 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 it's worth thinking about the work that each element is doing within the overall selection process. Um, but the people in the department, the people on the selection panel, um, they're there because you know, they're interested in you. They want to hear what you have to say, but they're not looking for you to fail. They're not looking to kind of trip you up or, or catch you out either. So it's, it's, I think, you know, enter into it in the sort of supportive and collaborative spirit that it's supposed to be. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matthew. I think that's all very, very true. Um, and also just to say again, I mean, do some research on the department. Figure out, just look through the people's page. Spend quite a long time working through the people's page. These are the people that you're going to be speaking to. Certainly um, look up who's going to be on the panel, but figure out who's in the department. I've been at job presentations where people have been able to indicate that they would like to collaborate on a course with somebody who already does this. And it may be slightly, you know, it's not obvious, that, it's not the most obvious choice. It may be a German history job, but they don't pick out the person doing German history, but somebody doing something completely different where there's an underlying research interest. And it just kind of suggests that some care and some preparation has been, been done um, and that you've got somebody who might be kind of interested in really becoming a, a member of the team of the department and um, that's really great um uh, Matthew thanks ever so much for that so does anybody want to comment on that or do you want to should we pass over to you Elaine to yeah go ahead I'll pass to Elaine to comment uh, and then move on to her yeah just just a brief comment because one of the things that I I know gets asked often and and it was uh, noted in, in one of our things that went around was you know what do you wear to the interview and, and I know that this is something that some people really get really concerned about. And I just wanted to say, be you know, smart, but comfortable. Um, the number of, of, of um, I, people I've had that I've known who have put on something that they're really uncomfortable in, they've never worn before, they're not comfortable in, and they spend more time worrying about what they're wearing than actually being able to engage. So be comfortable, but smart. And know that basically you're going to be working with these people. These are the people that that will be your colleagues, um, if you know if you're hired. And so you you know you don't want to present yourself as something you completely are not, but you also just want to make sure that you look professional.
brilliant thanks ever so much right i think elaine we're on to you next anyway aren't we yeah. our final yeah, yeah, we are. The, okay good enough um yeah about the formal interview um so let's let's just pass straight to, back to you right okay um can you hear me because i've got a strange uh, um message up on top of my computer screen i'm hearing you absolutely okay fine. great good enough yeah that's fine then um Basically, what I wanted to just say a little bit about was the formal interview itself, and, and we've already said quite a lot, so I don't think we'll probably have to say a huge amount, but basically the formal interview is the last part of the interview process, so you've already submitted your letter and your application, you've been shortlisted, and you've probably done your presentation, and as as um, uh, you know, as Matthew was saying, you may actually have, have done a, a teaching ex, um, display as well uh, to, to a group of students. So the formal interview is your, your final stage. This is usually going to be um, a combination of people who are, um, it may be run by the head of department, it may be run by the dean, it depends on the university as who's actually going to be the person in charge of the, the formal interview panel, but it's likely to include the, the head of department, him or herself, probably at least one other member of the department, often with a related uh, research interest or related experience, um, uh, a senior academic from another department. So there's, in other words, there's an academic non-specialist who you would be talking to, somebody from the university um, who's another academic. And usually there's some a member of our administrative team who is going to be a note taker. The process itself usually takes about 45 minutes, just so that you've got a sense of that. And as Matthew said, the, the purpose of the interview is to, to explore in more depth um, some of the things that might not have been, been dis, uh, discussed thus far, or they may take you off in slightly different directions. Um, you know, there may be things that, that um, you know, they want to ask you specifically about your approach to teaching or, you know, have you had any experience in hybrid teaching and where do you think you want to be in, in five years and how do you see your, your research strategy um, moving on to that? There's any number of different kinds of questions that you can be asked. Um, it's, it's very possible, well, it certainly is likely that not everyone who is on the interview panel will have attended the presentation. And so consequently, one of the things you might be asked is to very quickly give a, a, a concise um, introduction to your own research and to say something about why you've actually applied for the job. And that's always a really good chance for you to riff on your application. Um, and show how your skills and your expertise complement those already in the department. If you can name check some of the people that you you might your work complements, or you would be able to work with, or um, a, a, a course that's being offered that you think you'd be able to offer a course that would really fit well with. And this is a wonderful space to do that kind of a riff. It's an opening. It allows you to relax a little bit, but it also allows you to to play to your strengths. And I think that's really useful. Um, it also shows that you've done your homework on the department and that's absolutely crucial. Um, then there'll be questions that are going to come about, that are going to be tailored specifically to the job itself. So again, it will depend on what the, 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 the job advert is looking for. But around that, if it is a, a teaching and research job, there will definitely be some jobs or some, some questions around research and your research plans, research funding, and really around your next project. So where do you see yourself going? So it's always this business of thinking ahead a little bit. So you've got some answers and saying, well, all right, now I'm working on this and I'm looking at having the publication turned in an X amount of time. But what I'm already starting to think about is this project. And I think that would make a really good Leverhulme application or HRC, or I want to do, um, a, a, a BA small grant or whatever it is with a small network, you know, that start thinking about that so you can speak to it. it. Doesn't have to be long, but you just have some idea. Similarly, there'll be some questions about teaching, maybe asking about, you know, have you, have, can you say something about some of the, the biggest challenges that you found when you're teaching or how did you deal with this kind of a problem if you've run across it when you're teaching? Um, there may also be some questions about um, perhaps the wider uh, HE environment. You know, what do you think is the biggest challenge right now that, that uh, HE is facing? How, how do you think, you know, for instance, uh, in my university, one of our, 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 our 
really slow developers is how do we increase that diversity? How do we get more uh, BAME students uh, in and how do we work with that? So you might be asked to something like that. So think about the institution that you're going to be going to as well. Maybe what the research strategies are. Look at the data and the information that you've been sent. So if they've got a big research strategy, read the ruddy thing. It may be incredibly boring, but it's going to have some good points for you, good themes, and you might get picked up on them. Um, be specific, use concrete examples anytime you possibly can. If there, you're being talked about research and, and when you're going to be publishing something, if you can give dates, I've already said that, do that. It's really, really useful. You might be asked about kinds of things you might like to teach or, um, or offer for courses. That's great. You know, have an example. I'd love to be able to develop X. You know, I think it would really fit in. That's super. Um, the yeah, other thing, some, a question that often throws candidates, and it, it, it's really worth thinking about, uh, is what would make you a good colleague? You know, why would you be a good member of the department? Because that effectively says, well, you know, what does being a good colleague mean? You know, and how does that fit? So would it, does it mean that you'd be willing to step in for other people? Even you're academically generous, um, you're helpful, you're 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 compassionate, you're, you know, it depends on how you, how you structure that, but it's very, very useful. Um, at the end of the interview, after about 45 minutes, um, maybe an hour, depending upon how long the interview is scheduled for, there's gonna be a space for you to ask some questions. And the questions after the interview could be uh, as varied as, as you are effectively, but they may be well used uh, in, in a sense to explore something that you've got as a question about the university itself. You've noticed a research project that's ongoing in another department. Is there a potential for collaboration? Is there something that would play to your strengths um, and that you could develop or even some specific details about something that might uh, affect you? What's the parenting policy in the university? How parent friendly are they? Um, you know, details about, you know, what's the expectation for how many days a week you're, you're expected to be in? Um, how does teaching work on, you know, how many uh, hours per week do students get? You know, there's any number of ways you can ask something useful and relevant. Um, in terms of the decision making, uh, decisions on, on jobs are often made uh, quite quickly after the interview, after all of the, the information is taken in, the in feedback from the presentation panel, groups are, are included, um, any of that kind of information. So you might actually hear as quickly as that evening if you've been, uh, been chosen, been selected, but certainly it's likely that you'll hear within the week. And uh, you'll, uh, in most departments that I know of, uh, the head of department will phone you or whoever was running the interview will phone you and will will uh, talk over the interview with you, offer you the position. Or if you have not been, been um, offered the position, similarly, um, again, this is my experience. I don't know if this is universal. Um, you would be phoned as well. Now, I would phone you. I would talk it over with you. And that would give you the opportunity to say, could I have some feedback, please? And you can arrange for further information, uh, further um, meeting. To, to provide for feedback. And the feedback is re can be really useful. So I think that's probably isn't enough to say for the moment, because I, I'm sure there's some questions. Fantastic, yes. Um, really interesting, Elaine. I'll um, obviously welcome thoughts from um, Julian and Matthew, but I'll just say I have never been on a um, interview panel with Elaine, and yet everything that she said there is extremely, I've been on many panels, and everything she's saying is very familiar to me. There are a, a family of questions that come up over and over, whichever kind of job you're going for and wherever you are. And the ones that I think that I heard Elaine saying that are very familiar to me, why this job? Why here? Why now? Why, why, why us? I suppose anything else. Something about current research, something about future research that a good answer probably would point towards funding possibilities that you'd be interested in exploring. Something around teaching, very often something about what you would offer to this department, but also something that might be problem focused and that could be very difficult to prepare for because you don't quite know what problem they're going to throw at you but feel you know be, be, be braced for some problem focused question something around other and that good colleague question as well is one that's familiar to me although I've never as I say been on a panel with Elaine but I've certainly seen that same question being used um, more questions are coming in do put your questions in um uh, shall I just pass to Julian and Matthew we've, we've had a, a range of things that we've covered so far I'll just um encourage invite them to speak to any of those and then I'll start and feeding questions to the 
panel. Thank you, Liam. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. Um, Elaine described very much the process that I'm familiar with too, and I pick up the phone and, and ring people who've not been successful as well as people who've been successful. Um, uh, Elaine touched on, and then this elicited a bit of conversation in the chat already. I was just going to reflect on that. Um, do you have anything wider to say about the challenges in, in, in HE? And, you know, that, that there they are, the challenges in HE, manifold and complicated. I think there are things that at all career stages, historians are well equipped to do that will have modest or more significant impact. And when you're seeking to join a team of historians who are aware of discourse around the value of humanities education, there are things that we can all say about the value, about the value of humanities education in the UK today. And, and it, then there may be an opportunity for you to address that kind of challenging, slightly difficult issue of what are the challenges in HE today with something positive to say about, well, at my level as a junior member of the department, I can see myself at open days being a loquacious advocate for what it is we're doing when we're training young people to think about context, to, to think about cultural diversity, all, all those kinds of things that we do talk about a lot as historians. So that's something I would just sort of can, 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 continuing that little thought process. Um, something positive that you can take to that bit of the conversation. Brilliant, thanks. So, um, as I say, several questions. One of the ones that um, has come in that I think is relevant, uh, picks up a little bit about um, applying for jobs as well, is about specialism and fit and how we decide uh, whether it's suitable and worth our while going for a job and not. And there's a, a, a number of questions around these themes. I'm in this department, is it legitimate that I apply for a job in a different department? My PhD is in this topic, the job advert is a little bit obscure about the dates, is this going to work for me? So I just wonder if the panel would like to speak um, to that as to, uh, as to how close and exact and precise the fit needs to be between what we perceive ourselves to be and what we see um, an advertised job, you know, when we see advertised jobs and asking for things that are slightly different. Um, I mean, I, I suppose the answer is actually, well, in my experience, which perhaps isn't as extensive as other members of the panels, but um, it, it does vary. And I mean, you can sometimes detect clues to this in the way an advert is written. Um, I mean, <laughs> Normally adverts will be written with a kind of geographic and a chronological framing, uh, although not always. And, and in my department, we've increasingly advertised jobs in thematic or methodological ways. So, you know, we want a historian visual culture uh, or, or whatever it might be, or science and technology. And we very consciously not prescribe that geographically or chronologically. Sometimes a department uh, goes with quite a, a broad framing precisely because they want to attract the widest field possible. Um, in which case, you know, that's a sort of a, a green light to kind of go for it if you think you, you can speak to what they're talking about. Um, if they're more specific or more precise, I do think it's worth thinking carefully about whether you can present yourself as a good fit without kind of contorting who you are as a researcher, um, you know, sort of in a sense kind of trying to pass as something that you're not really because um, the sort of time and effort that goes into writing applications, uh, the process, it, it's exhausting. Um, not least because every university has a different system. So you're not simply kind of retooling a stand a cover letter, you're often generating different parts of an application. Um, so, I mean, you know, the point's been made already, but I think you know, seeking guidance from a supervisor or a mentor, you know, does this look like a good fit? Is this something that, that I should consider applying for? It's, it's probably the first place to, to, to think about that, first place to start. And I'll do really quickly, I guess, part of that is that if they're looking for a medievalist and you're somebody at the very end of the medieval period or whatever, one of the reasons they're looking for a medievalist is that they hope that you are going to be a pole of attraction for PhD students five, ten years from now. And can you really do that if you're really kind of Elizabeth I and after, but can teach a bit of medieval because you always did teach a bit of medieval in your previous post. So that's the difference, I think, is are they looking for that really solid long term commitment that's going to build master's students in this area etc etc and, and that's how how those things are sometimes defined i think that's right i think there are sometimes um time periods or nations where we are quite specific we do want this period we do want this particular nation but then there are questions of approach um and interdisciplinarity is another thing that came up and 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 background, whether you come from a slightly more literature-focused or a language-focused department rather than a strictly historical department, 
very often you may well be able to make the case that you are the right person to attract people. The department will have mapped out a part of the world and a time period usually that they're interested in, um, but they are unlikely to be very prescriptive about the precise approach that you take, uh, the, the, the kind of intellectual academic approach that you take to the topic. So I would encourage people to be broad um, within limits, I think within limits. There's another question in there, a set of questions, a couple of questions about absence of, you know, about how to address things that we may not have done, particularly when these are an absence of opportunities that we couldn't ever have had. Um, one person has raised an illness is another thing where if there's a gap on the CV, if you feel there's a gap on the CV that you have, how much should we talk about this in our applications? Is that something that we should uh, try to gloss or is it something that we should talk about in cover letters and on CVs? In our panel. Elaine. Um, but from my experience, I would say be honest. And, you know, if you've, um, if you've been ill, say you've been ill, you know, and, uh, you know, you've had to take some time out. These, these things happen, life happens. Uh, you know, we, we are, are, are very much looking at dealing with you know, equality and diversity. And, you know, we, we do not want to discriminate against people. Um, same thing is if you have taken maternity leave and, and you've been out, out of the um, academe for a year or even more because you've, you've had uh, children and that's taken you, taken you out. Or there are other reasons why you've been taken out. You know, you've been, been part of a military family and away out of country. You know, simply make that make that clear. What you want to be able to do is show that you're still in in the game effectively, and that's really what what matters. The fact that you you had to take a bit of time out isn't really the issue if you meet the other criteria. Oops. Thanks, great. Um, several more questions in the chat. I'll just move on to um, another one. This. Uh, well, somebody's asked so some, um, some slightly more specific questions about cover letters and um, one person has asked what's the ideal length of a cover letter and I think that's worth talking about for a moment and I'll just throw in at the same time um, something that we missed from the first half of the um, event about applications between research fellowships and postdocs on funded projects. We haven't been talking very much about applying for uh, positions on, on funded projects. Um, but they can be a very important stepping stone for people um, in, the, in the transition from finishing a PhD um, to have perhaps getting a, 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 funded, a, a permanent post. So I just encourage the um, panel to have a little think about the funded project um, and specifics about the, the cover letter and how long that might be. I was just going to jump in just on the cover letter. I think different people will say different things to me three sides for this kind of career stage would probably be go outright and I know that in the states often early career scholars are encouraged to write a paragraph that describes I've, I've certainly seen this several times a paragraph that describes not just the thesis but each chapter in the thesis that's going to make a longer letter and that certainly gives you a sense it's very exciting reading them but it, I mean you, we, we don't usually have time to read that many letters that will be like that so so if you're from that background, actually, we want you to compress that dis that description of the thesis into into a paragraph. Three sides, maybe spilling over to four. Somebody might say two, but I think three is probably good. Do you think? Yeah. No. I mean, it is it is how long is a piece of string? But I, I certainly agree. But we do not want too long. We don't want them to be too long at this at this level. Yeah. And I would say for a more senior post as well, actually, Julian, um, three three pages is enough. Of the relevant material to this particular job usually. Elaine? Yes, I, I really agree with that um, and also with the same thing with the, with the CVA just to, to underline I once had um, someone apply for a job with a 75 page CV um, and uh, I, it was <laughs> impossible, simply impossible, um, but I, I think that yeah the shorter, shorter cover letter is, is important, um, be concise, that's really I think the most important thing. Brilliant. So again, a few more um, questions. Um, Joshua has asked about selecting references. I think that's a good question to consider. Um, and another person, Leah Kosina, has asked if one's application is rejected before the interview, can one ask for feedback? It, so, that, so Elaine and I both said, and we've tried to sort of suggest that we're you know, really wonderful and pick up the phone after interviews and talk to people. My experience is that we really, really difficult to find the time to do that at the first stage. 
if we've had a hundred applicants, which is typical, um, we're marking people against criteria. And so the, the most you're likely to get is, is to say, well, we, we, we read your application against the criteria that are set out. And we were afraid that whilst you, know, you, you met many of them, there were other candidates who met them more fully than you did. And, and it's difficult for us to go much beyond that because otherwise, you know, we'd be having to do that a hundred times. And we do give that level of care to the people who've come to interview, I'd say, and, and really try hard at that stage. So that's a, that's not a very helpful answer maybe, but but I think that's just the, the sort of the experience that I've had anyway. I would agree. I think the rejections, you'll need to speak usually if you haven't made it to the shortlist to the people who are supporting you in your applications. And, and I should add as well, it's a very, very tough world out there. Very often we have uh, far too many qualified people for a job and people don't make it onto the shortlist, not because there is anything wrong with them or because there's anything wrong with their application, but because we only have four or five slots and we have 10 entirely plausible people and we just do the very best that we can. And there's no really strong there's not much more that we can say um, as to why somebody doesn't make the cut sometimes than that it is a very difficult um uh it's a difficult world out there and that sometimes is 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 the explanation you can do everything right and still not make make it to a short list elaine i was just going to say something about the references because i think that's really important and, and matthew may want to add in or, or julian as well um references really matter and so you want to get good, strong references. And please, please make sure if you're um, getting references that you have asked your referees in advance and you've got their approval so that you aren't going through. And then all of a sudden somebody's saying, well, no, they've, ne they've never asked me, you know, and they may, they may not refuse, but they also may not give you the kind of reference that you, you would want. So you want somebody who, who knows your work um, somebody who may be in, in a similar field, uh, maybe maybe using your supervisor as well, somebody who you've taught for, you know, try and get a range of, of, of referees who you know can sing your praises and give you a really good, thorough um, uh, reference. I think that's right. Uh, uh, oh, Matthew, go ahead. No, sorry, I, I was just, like, like you, I was going to agree. And I, I think it's, you say, um, so someone that can speak enthusiastically and in some detail so yeah, it's not just about seeking out the biggest name in your field and asking them because you know, the, the chances are they may also be writing for other people and it's, it's, it's not at all unusual to see the same referee uh, cropping up on, on multiple applications depending on how a job is framed uh, I mean, sometimes that can be very useful but, but, but from your perspective as a candidate you know, the most important thing is a strong endorsement that speaks to your individual strengths that isn't going to be too generic uh, but but, but um, it really tells us something in support of who you are in your application. I was just going to say exactly the same thing. A thin reference from a very significant field in the um, figure in the field is less valuable than a very full reference from somebody who clearly does know you and can speak to you as an individual. So I think we're all very much on the same page there. Um, I have another question about um, uh, somebody who said they are prepared. They prepared in the US, and I think the um, it's worth just saying that the, the level of preparation and training that people get in the US is usually very, very good. Um, and um, it's often, it is sometimes noticeable um, that US applicants will come very, very well prepared compared to some of the British um, applicants. Anyway, this person writes, um, I was taught to speak in some detail about the content intervention implications of our research in covering letters and other applications materials. I've been a bit confused about whether this, this is something that is valued in UK application materials. Do hiring committees want to know what my book is about, what it argues, how it intervenes, or should an application um, focus more on listing deliverables, referable outputs, potential grant application impact, etc. And I think that's um, a very good way of framing the, the two different approaches. Um, I encourage people to speak to that. Yes, this kind of connects with a couple of the points I guess I was making earlier. I've, I've certainly seen letters from people um, who uh, are in America who are writing in that way and they talk at length. So my, I, I would say, yes, do talk in that way. And it's, that's the show not tell point. Do talk about what the work actually is doing intellectually, but we're asking you know, for that to be done in a concise way. And, and I've, I've seen a lot of letters that, um, as I say, go actually paragraph by paragraph through each chapter of the thesis, that's too long. But at the same time, part of 
thinking of into the UK university system is that you're going to be asked to come up with ideas for future collaborations that are going to lead to fund funding opportunities and so and, and, and you're going to be asked to give us a sense of what you think your best work is in a ref cycle. So now we're at the early part of the cycle, looking ahead over the next six or seven years, what are the, going to be the two big peaks of what you're hoping to achieve? And so, so give us an indication of that, but try and do it through the show not tell method of really explaining the originality and the exciting qualities that that work brings, and we'll be able to see that. So it's not a kind of instrumentalist I do sometimes see people say, next I'm going to write a 3.5 star article, and after that I'd like to write a 4 star article. And I'd just much rather find out what the hell the articles are going to be about, and then we'll start to get an idea of the depth and excitement that those that, that work's going to bring to bear. So, so we, we've got some practical concerns that you need to try and understand and, and, and speak to, um, but you can do that through, through talking about the strength of the work. Brilliant, Julian. Thank you ever so much. Right, I've got an eye on the time. Yeah, Matthew, go ahead. Sorry, it was. I mean, this won't be relevant to everyone, no, but I, uh, I suppose another aspect of the application is that you'll be invited to submit written work, and I suppose choosing what you submit matters. Um, and it may be you know, if you have an article in a, a good peer review journal, and that, that's the obvious choice. Um, but there's, there's, you know, I think sometimes you know, it has to be the most recent thing you've worked on, or it, you know, should it be a piece in draft? Um, and, and I guess you know, it's a chance to showcase your work. And again, it, it will be read by people that are, you know, the, the panel will be sort of broadly specialist, but not very precise subject specialists. So I think choose work that, that, that shows the kinds of interventions you want to make in the field, not necessarily the most recent thing you've got or something that's still in early draft that, that you think will be great in, in a kind of, you know, a year's time. Um, so just because, yeah, we sometimes get asked that question as well. Okay, thank you. Just, there's just one last, I mean, there are more questions. I haven't been able to get quite through all of them, but there's just one other one that I will um, throw out to people, and that's about jobs and the nature of them being advertised. In the UK, do we um, make internal hires? Are there jobs, are, are jobs always externally advertised? Um, my experience is actually that they are. That's not to say that we don't sometimes recruit people who know um, the particular given department quite well and already have contacts with the department. But I think jobs usually are advertised, and I think that's quite a significant part of what's going on um, in, in the kind of the recruitment process. But I'll let others, I mean, uh, you, you have more experience as head of departments about that. Uh, do you want to, anybody want to come in on that one? That was jobs being advertised externally or internally, and whether, how we find out where jobs are available and what jobs are, what jobs are there. Um, I, I, I'll go ahead, Julian, and I'll come in afterwards. Um, uh, we, I, I think that for, for jobs of the kind that we're talking about, they'll always be advertised externally, always, always, always. Um, very occasionally at a senior level in a university, they, they may um, be looking for an internal candidate, but that's pretty rare. And even then, they quite often put it up externally anyway, even if they're encouraging. Inter but I'm really talking about, you know, deputy vice chancellor level for, for mainstream academic posts, jobs at UK. And that's that, because we want we want a wide field. Yes, and I, I will uh, second that and say that uh, even if uh, there's there's something coming up where there is a, a possibility for an internal candidate to apply, somebody who's already been teaching for us for a period of time, they may have the chance to see the job application in advance, you know, of, of it going out on Jobs at UK or on the university website as well, because the, the, often the university websites will have jobs as well as things like Jobs at UK. But the, there will there will be an external application, um, and often jobs will be advertised on multiple frameworks and they'll or, and multiple. Uh, networks, so you'll see things that are coming through, say, for instance, um, I'm an 18th centuryist, so the British Society for 18th Century Studies may, may circulate that there are jobs coming up, you know, but they will all be uh, put up nowadays on things like job acts up, Jobs Act Hug. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. The, with my um, eye on the time, I think it is time for us to wrap up. I just want to make one uh, very quick point about something that's come up in the chat about a four-star article. We're talking about a good quality research article there, one that will be um, submitted potentially to our research assessment um, exercise. It has various different names, but uh, we're basically just talking about a very good research article in a peer-reviewed journal there. 
But I will um, draw the event to a close now as we are very nearly on the hour. I would love to thank uh, Julian, Matthew and Elaine so much. I think they've um, really talked in great detail about various elements of the job preparation, you know, of the process of preparing for a job, brought very different um, insights. Um, and I think it's really heartening to hear um, so many points of interest as well around what it is that we're looking for. And, and I thank them very much for giving up their afternoon to help communicate that to um, our audience. Um, I'd just like to close with a few notes. We're going to be spending, sending an email to everybody who is here in the event right now with a link to the video. So uh, no need to kind of look out for that. that will, you'll, you'll get an automatic reminder, basically, when that's available on our website. I'd like to just remind you as well that this is part of a series of events that we run for people at early career stage. Um, we've had previous workshops on the theme of public history and on getting your first article published, hopefully your first four star article published. All of that is already available on the RHS website. And the next in our series is going to be on a related theme, applying for history related jobs outside universities. Um, so do come back and join us for that event um, if you are interested in perhaps looking for employment outside universities as opposed to inside. Um, just also to say a few words about our society, the RHS as it is today. If you're here because you're a current PhD student or if you're a recent PhD student and an early career um, uh, historian interested in keeping in touch with other historians, do look at our website and look at the Join Us pages. There's lots of different ways of getting involved in the Royal Historical Society. Um, we welcome applications from people at all career stages and we'd love to welcome you inside the society if you're not already a member. Um, and just a short plug as well, we've been talking about getting your first article published. We, the Royal Historical Society, have a journal called The Transactions of the Royal Historical Societies, and we welcome um, submissions from people at all career stages, but we very warmly welcome um, early career historians submitting articles for considerations to our journal as well. So do please um, consider publishing with us. But uh, that's it for today. I'd just like to say once again, thank you to our panel. Thanks to everybody who's here and hopefully see you at another event soon. Bye.